Hello class and welcome to this week in Lifespan Development. This week we will be taking a look at Middle and Late Childhood. My name is Dr. Neil Sogi and I will be your instructor for this course. Now before we embark on this journey, I encourage you to take a moment and just reflect upon your own childhood experiences. I want you to consider the, the moments that shaped you during those middle and late childhood years. Perhaps it was forming friendships on the playground. Maybe it was navigating challenges of school or discovering new interests and talents. I want you to reflect upon these memories because they offer valuable insights into the developmental processes that we will be talking about today. And hopefully, we'll make this topic a little more personal to you. Now, just a little bit about what we'll be talking about in today's lecture. We will be covering a little bit of the story. Then we will explore uh, three aspects of middle and late childhood. First off, we'll explore a little bit of the physical development. And examine some of the patterns of growth and the refinement of motor skills and the crucial role of health and nutrition during this stage. Then we will explore the cognitive development. Um, and here we're going to focus on Piaget's theory of the concrete operational stage, uh, focusing on the insights from information processing theory. And we'll also dive into how children's thinking becomes more logical and more organized and adept during these middle and late childhood years. And additionally, we'll explore some language and literacy development as key components of this cognitive growth. Of course, we're also going to explore some socio-emotional development. We're going to look at, at peer relationships and family dynamics and emotional regulation because those are real central themes during this time in life. We'll also explore a little bit about how children navigate social interactions, how they form attachments, and understand and manage their emotions during this period of time. So, in the midst of all of that, I hope that you really enjoy discovering a little bit about yourself and about children. Now, I want to start off by taking a bit of a deep dive into a researcher that's really profoundly important for this period, but for all people across the lifespan. And that is a fellow by the name of Lawrence Kohlberg. Now, Lawrence Kohlberg was born in 1927 in uh, New York, and he passed away in 1987. And his research really significantly contributed to our understanding of moral development, particularly during middle and late childhood. Now, there's some key important points that I want to bring home with Lawrence Kohlberg. First off, he identified that there are stages of moral development. And Kohlberg proposed a six-stage theory of moral development grouped into three levels. We have the pre-conventional, the conventional, and the post-conventional phases. And during middle and late childhood, children typically transition from the pre-conventional to the conventional level. Now, here's some things to kind of keep in mind. At the pre-conventional level, moral reasoning is based upon self-interest. And it really adheres to rules about avoiding punishment and gaining rewards. So in middle childhood, you can kind of think of that is the motivation. You know, that a child wants rewards, they want to avoid punishment. Now, in contrast, at the conventional level, moral judgments are influenced by social norms and laws and societal expectations for most children in late childhood. And so children in middle and late childhood begin to consider the perspectives of others and understand the importance of maintaining social order and interpersonal relationships. 
Now, one of the interesting ways that Kohlberg went about his research was something called moral dilemmas. And he wasn't really interested in the answer to the moral dilemma. He was interested in why children answered the way they did. What was the reasoning going on? And so for Kohlberg's research, he really involved presenting individuals with moral dilemmas. And one of those famous ones was something called the Heinz Dilemma which explores moral reasoning in the context of stealing in order to save a life. And he observed in this how children reasoned through these dilemmas and identified distinct stages of moral development based upon the reasoning processes that they employed. And so, Kohlberg's work significantly influenced theories of moral development and ethical reasoning. His stage theory provided a framework for understanding how individuals progress morally and emphasized the importance of moral processes rather than just behaviors. And Kohlberg's research has had applications in various fields like education and citizenship and psychology and ethics. And it really shapes our discussion about the idea of moral education and the cultivation of ethical decision-making skills. Despite the criticisms and ongoing debates about this, it's fairly clear that Kohlberg's contribution has really remained foundational in understanding the moral development of individuals, particularly during middle and late childhood. And for myself, I was really fascinated in one of my master's programs in exploring the ideas of moral development and how teens developed in their moral, cognitive moral reasoning as well. So this is a fascinating area to uh, keep in mind that, you know, how does a child know what is right and what is wrong and that sort of explanation and exploration. So um, I want to now backtrack a little bit and dive into kind of the fundamentals here. Um, what do we talk about when we mean middle and late childhood? Well, we can normally think of middle childhood typically spanning around the ages of 6 through 11, while late childhood typically extends from approximately 11, 12, 13 years old. And these ages are, are characterized by some significant physical, cognitive, and socio-emotional changes. As children begin that transition from early childhood into adolescence. And it's really important, I think, to identify these developmental periods because they represent critical phases of development where children consolidate some important skills that are acquired in earlier years and it begins to prepare them for the challenges that come in adolescence because adolescence is a difficult time. And during this period, they refine their cognitive abilities, they solidify a sense of who they are in their social group and they establish social relationships that lay the foundation for their future developments. And so there's a few key things that we'll be taking a look at. We've already mentioned those. Physical development, as in broad strokes, children experience steady growth here. They improve their motor skills and they become um, more consolidated in their body composition. They become more proportional and their physical abilities become more refined, allowing them to engage in complex activities and engage in sports. Then there's the cognitive development. And here, this kind of growth is marked by advancements in logical reasoning, in problem solving, and also in significant improvements in language comprehension. Uh, children become more adept at understanding abstract concepts and applying knowledge to real world situations. And from the socio-emotional development, middle and late childhood is characterized by a sense of self-concept, of social skills and emotional regulation, and also of that important shift in being able to consider others 
when making decisions. That conventional moral reasoning phase of Lawrence Colbert. And children here form close friendships. They begin to navigate the family dynamics and begin to understand and regulate their emotions much more effectively. At least that's something that you would expect. Now, when we kind of narrow in and focus just on physical development in childhood, so in middle and late childhood, children will experience really a steady but still a slower rate of growth than what had occurred in infancy and early childhood. But they do typically gain around two to three inches in height and about five to seven pounds in weight each year. And so growth spurts do occur. Um, and this is especially around that initial onset of puberty in late childhood. And that can vary wildly with individuals. As far as the motor skills development goes, uh, motor skills become more refined during that middle and late childhood period. Uh, children gain better control of their bodies. Their gross motor skills, such as running and jumping and throwing, continue to improve. And this enables them to participate in sports and to begin to excel in physical activities. And the fine motor skills also advance, allowing them to engage in activities like writing and drawing and using tools or instruments with greater precision. But there's also, in the midst of that physical development, the importance of health and nutrition considerations. Uh, nutrition plays a crucial role here in supporting healthy growth and development during this middle and late childhood period. And children need a balanced diet, uh, rich in all of the essential nutrients and, and vitamins and minerals to support their physical and cognitive development. And some other important things, they need adequate sleep. They need regular physical activity and proper hygiene and training and proper hygiene are also vital for overall health and well-being during this stage. So there's a lot that goes into the maintaining the physical development of the child. But then we come to the cognitive development and here I want to focus on Piaget's theory of concrete operational stage. Now, according to Jean Piaget's theory, middle and late childhood can coincide with the concrete operational states of cognitive development, which typically spans from around 7 through to 11. Now, during this stage, children demonstrate more sophisticated cognitive abilities compared to earlier stages. Um, they become capable of logical reasoning. They understand conservation, that is understanding that quantity remains the same despite the changes in appearance. They understand classification, that is sorting of objects into categories based on shared attributes and seriation. That is, they can arrange objects in a series based on a specific dimension. They also um, change in their information processing. Um, how children acquire, store, and use information changes. So during this middle and late childhood, there's an improvement in, first off, attention. Also, memory and finally in processing speed. And children become better at focusing their attention, at filtering out distractions, and maintaining concentration for longer periods of time. And their memory capacity expands, allowing them the retention of more information over time. And additionally, processing speed increases, enabling quicker and more efficient cognitive processing. And finally, there's language and literacy development. And middle and late childhood is also a crucial time for language and literacy development. 
uh, children continue to expand their vocabulary and they refine their grammar skills and enhance their comprehension abilities. And reading becomes more fluent and more automatic in this stage. And this leads to greater proficiency in understanding and interpreting written text. And additionally, writing skills progress as children learn to express themselves more clearly and cohesively through written communication. And so literacy skills play a vital role in academic success and overall cognitive development during this stage. Now, when we look at socio-emotional development, one of the first things that we need to be mindful of here is peer relationships. Um, during middle and late childhood, peer relationships become extremely important. Children develop friendships based on shared interests and activities and proximity. And these friendships provide opportunities for social interaction and cooperation and emotional support. And peer groups also serve as contexts for learning social skills, for navigating conflicts and developing a sense of belonging and identity. And while peer relationships gain prominence, the family continues to play a central role in socio-emotional development during this middle and late childhood period. Um, family dynamics like parent and child relationships, like sibling interactions and family routines, shape a child's sense of security and values and beliefs. And it needs to be flexible. And that is where some of the challenges can sometimes come in because children are constantly changing, but sometimes the family dynamics are not flexible and do not adjust with them. And so there can be a significant amount of conflict when that happens. But when the family dynamics are flexible, and there's positive family relationships that contributes to emotional well-being and provides a supportive environment for navigating challenges and transitions. And then with middle and late childhood, that's characterized by significant advancements in emotional regulation and understanding. Children become more adept at identifying and expressing their emotions as well as recognizing and interpreting the feelings of others, and they learn strategies for coping with stress, uh, for managing conflicts and regulating emotional responses in various social situations. And the de development of emotional competence during this stage lays the groundwork for healthy relationships and adaptive functioning in adolescence and beyond. Now, as always, I always want to bring up something with Erickson. And uh, maybe I should, before I do that, kind of bring up something with, with uh, Freud. Freud, for Freud in this stage, this is the latency phase where there is, the sexual drive is kind of s sublimated into um, just peer relationships. And that's why... You know, boys hang out with boys, girls hangs out with girls during the States, typically. But with Erickson, with Erickson and the psychosocial theory, industry versus inferiority is one of the key point values that need to kind of be clarified at this stage. And Erickson proposed that during middle and late childhood, children face the psychosocial crisis of industry versus inferiority. And so this stage you can kind of think of between 6 and 12. And really characterized by the need to master skills and tasks and to contribute to a sense of competence and accomplishment. In essence, what does a child feel like they're good at? Everybody needs to feel good at something. Do they have a sense of industry or do they feel inferior in all things? And that can very easily happen. You know, a lot of research has been done just simply in sports cycles. You know, 
kids that are a few months older in, in from the cutoff for sports teams are always going to dominate during this stage. So they're the kids born in the first few months of the year are always going to be the ones that are really thriving in sports because they're just that little bit of stronger, a little bit more developed than their peers, and so they're going to dominate. So what other areas do people kind of feel like they're successful in? Well, there's academics, there's hobbies, there's um, seeking recognition and validation from some other effort. And so one of the values here is for kids to find a successful resolution to this crisis that leads to a sense of industry and competence and confidence. Now, conversely, unresolved feelings of inadequacy and failure may result in feelings of inferiority and low self-esteem that carry on throughout life. So it's important to deal with this stage and give important priority to this stage and help a child feel that they have developed a sense of industry. And self-concept here and self-esteem in middle and late childhood ties in with this significantly. It plays a because this is a real crucial period for the development of self-concepts and self-esteem. Self-concepts really refers to the beliefs and attitudes and, and perceptions that people have and that they hold about themselves, including their abilities and attributes and identities. And self-esteem reflects the overall evaluation of one's sense of worth and value. And positive experiences and, and feedback from peers and family and teachers contribute to a healthy self-concept and high self-esteem. Conversely, negative experiences or criticism may undermine self-confidence and lead to feelings of insecurity. Now, the last thing is cultural and social influences. Um, here, cultural and social influences play a significant role in shaping the child's psychosocial development. Cultural values and norms and expectations really do get embedded within the child during this period of time. It forms their self-concept, their identity, and their interpersonal relationships. And the social context, such as the peer groups and schools and communities provide opportunities for social comparison for for trying to figure out okay how good am i where do i fit in and it also provides an opportunity for learning learning about culture what are the stories of the culture what stories re relate to me how does this inform my identity because that starts to be a thing at the end of late childhood what is my identity and so understanding the interplay between cultural and social factors really also is an important thing to be mindful of when thinking about a child's self-concept self-esteem and development then we can think in terms of school and academic achievement in middle and late childhood, there are some critical periods of cognitive development within school settings. Schools provide uh, structured environments where, where kids acquire and refine their academic skills like reading and writing and math and critical thinking. And classroom instruction really focuses on fostering cognitive processes such as problem solving and reasoning and information processing. And educational activities and assignments challenge children to apply knowledge and think creatively and communicate effectively. Now, children may encounter various challenges during middle and late childhood that impact their academic achievement. And these challenges may include learning disabilities, um, attention difficulties, language barriers, or socio-emotional issues. And it's really incumbent upon educators and parents to employ strategies to support academic success. Uh, 
whether this be differentiated instruction or individualized learning plan or tutoring or counseling services, uh, creating a supportive environment that addresses diverse learning and fosters a mindset that is essential for um, helping a child succeed. Now, here I just want to, to bring home the point that raising a child is not just providing uh, food and shelter. It is understanding where a child is at, what their developmental needs are, helping to support those needs, and remembering that this is a moving target that and recognizing that while they may not be struggling this month six months from now they may be struggling intensely and so it's important to take time to check in with teachers to check in most importantly with the child themselves when there is an open relationship with the child so you're not just barking instructions all the time but you have an opportunity to have uh, open conversations with the child then you are really developing uh, the kind of relationship that the child needs so that you can be responsive as an adult to the child's needs want to kind of circle back now to Kohlberg's stages of moral reasoning. Um, as I mentioned, Lawrence Kohlberg proposed a six-stage theory of moral development characterized by uh, those three general levels. We And just to kind of be a little simple, we have the pre-conventional, uh, which is kind of selfishness, conventional, whereas you're thinking about others, and post-conventional, where you are thinking about the overall um, values of justice and care and love. And during middle and late childhood, children are typically transitioning from pre-conventional to conventional level. And the pre-conventional level, moral reasoning, is based upon self-interest and adherence to rules to avoid punishment or gain rewards and in the conventional level which often emerges during late childhood moral judgments are influenced by social norms and laws and societal expectation but it's based upon the idea of um, the higher idea the post-conventional idea of um, care and love and justice for all and children begin to consider their perspectives of others here and begin to understand the importance of maintaining social order and interpersonal relationships. One of the important things to be mindful of here is this is what is called a frontal lobe activity. That is the part of your brain right behind your forehead is where this moral development happens. And so the brain is slowly adjusting to develop these capacities. And that, that part of the brain doesn't actually fully mature until you're about 25 years old. So you need to kind of remember that there's some limitations in what children can do. But one of the important things to be mindful of here is the simple fact that children catch moral development reasoning by being around mature adults and hearing mature adults talking in terms that are more post-conventional or at least conventional and by talking and allowing children to just be around at the feet of adults as they talk about things and ideally talking in in a more high uh, reasoning level than often what you would say, for example, here in a bar, but something a little more deeper than that. So like in a school or in a religious organization or something somewhere where uh, family and peers and society can uh, explore these issues 
and have social exchange and talk and struggle through moral dilemmas. When children see adults actively struggling through these things, and when societal institutions and schools and religious organizations and cultural organizations convey moral messages that reinforce the cultural norms and the ethical standards, that interplay has a profound influence upon the child's moral beliefs and attitudes and behaviors. And so it pulls the, ideally it pulls the child along. And that allows the child to then develop into that conventional phase. Now, ideally, we would like everyone to be post-conventional, but not everybody's going to get there. But what we can do is help them explore, like explore with them moral dilemmas, explore with them decision-making processes. Why are you thinking this way? And so middle and late childhood are characterized by this increasing exposure to moral dilemmas and decision-making scenarios. And children encounter situations that require them to weigh conflicting interests, consider consequences, and make ethical choices. It doesn't have to be something big and difficult and abstract. It can be something very simple and closer to the heart of the child. And these moral dilemmas, such as conflicts between honesty and loyalty, or fairness and self-interest, those kinds of things provide an opportunity for the child to engage in moral reasoning and decision-making. Because it isn't just about following the rules from that point on. It's about encouraging them to take ownership of their own choices. They're trying, you're trying to get them to transition away from fear of punishment towards care for others. And so through reflection and practice and discussion and guidance with adults, children develop moral principles. They learn how to use their frontal lobe. They learn how to develop empathy and a sense of social responsibility. And all of those things can go a long ways to making the child more resistant to things like, for example, addiction, because uh, a weak frontal lobe can very quickly lead to addiction. Because one of the things the frontal lobe does is put a stop to behaviors with negative consequences. And so if that's never developed, then when a substance is being used, for example, and there's no stop, that's when an addiction forms. So it's about skills and values that are acquired during this developmental period that lays the foundation for ethical decision-making, moral behavior in adolescence and in adulthood. Now, here I also want to uh, just kind of highlight a little bit of Freudian psychosexual development in ch childhood. Um, Sigmund Freud's psychosexual theory here posits that personality development is influenced by that interaction of biological drives and social experiences, particularly during childhood. And Freud identified several psychosexual stages, um, including the oral stage, the anal stage, the phallic stage, the latency stage, and the genital stage. And while Freud's theory, you know, has been under a lot of criticism, you can see the latency stage quite clearly in middle and late childhood. And here, according to Freud's theory, children are in the latency phase, which spans roughly from the ages of 6 through to 11. So during this stage, the sexual impulses are relatively dormant. And the focus of psychosexual development shifts from the formation towards the formation of social and intellectual skills. So children become focused upon developing relationships with peers, on engaging in hobbies and activities and clubs and acquiring knowledge and competence through school and other social experiences. And this latency stage provides a period of relative stability and 
uh, consolidation dur just before the onset of puberty where the reemergence of sexual impulses in adolescence comes out hugely. Um, you can see a huge difference between uh, kids in middle and late adulthood and kids in early adolescence. And while Freud's emphasis on psychosexual stages has been challenged, there is still a lot that you can see in children that does seem to be borne out in that. Now, at this stage, the idea of gender development also kind of gets uh, thrown in here. Um, there, of course, is going to be variability between people, so I'm just going to talk in terms of general uh, concepts here. So, we have gender identity versus gender role. And gender development during middle and late childhood really involves the formation of gender identity and a sense, internal sense of being male or female or maybe non-binary. And children become increasingly aware of their own gender identity and begin to understand that it is consistent over time. And gender roles, on the other hand, refer to the societal expectations and, and norms associated with being male or female. And so during middle and late childhood, children learn about gender roles through socialization experiences, including family and peers and media and cultural influences. And in middle and late childhood, you can then see that there's a period when children become more aware of things like gender stereotypes, uh, beliefs about the characteristics and behaviors and roles deemed appropriate for males and females. And these stereotypes can influence children's attitudes and interests and behaviors, shaping their self-concept and social interactions. And socialization processes reinforce gender stereotypes through messages conveyed by adults or peers and media. And so children may experience pressure to conform to gender norms, which can impact their self-esteem and limit their choices and their opportunities. And so that can be a challenge. And research does suggest that gender differences in cognitive and social development do begin to emerge during middle and late childhood. Um, while there is considerable overlap between genders, there are some patterns of differences that may be observed. For example, uh, girls tend to excel in things like verbal abilities and social skills, whereas boys may demonstrate strengths in uh, spatial reasoning and physical activities. And these differences may be influenced by biological factors, but also by socialization experiences, as well as probably some cultural expectations. And so understanding that there's a lot of complexity in gender development will hopefully uh, provide you with what you need to help the child to navigate their own sense of gender, uh, their gender identity, and how they feel that they fit into gender roles as they move towards their adolescence. Now, there are some common challenges that we see within middle and late childhood. Uh, this is, after all, a developmental period that does have some significant challenges. Uh, even though uh, people often think of this as the calm time in development, there are things like peer pressure, uh, peer relationships, because they're so significant, children face pressure to conform to peer norms and behaviors. And this can oftentimes lead to conflicts between an individual's identity and their group acceptance. There's also academic stress. Um, there can be demands of schoolwork and standardized tests and extracurricular activities that create a lot of stress upon the child. P 
parents can oftentimes overbook a child. They have such high expectations from the parents and teachers and peers that that can begin to contribute to feelings of pressure and anxiety. And of course, there's bullying. Uh, bullying behavior, including verbal and physical and relational aggression, can negatively impact children's socio-emotional well-being. And victims of bullying may experience low self-esteem and depression and social withdrawal. And here's something I want to highlight about bullying. Uh, lots of times people would say that, you know, bullying just means that the bully feels bad about themselves. That's not quite true. Um, a lot of time, uh, there's a small component of the population, let's say about 10 to 20 percent of the population, that just automatically feels good about themselves and has low empathy for others. And exerting power is a source of pleasure for them. And it's this small group that oftentimes can uh, engage in bullying and it can have a significant impact upon the other populations. Uh, because there is a third of the population, it's going to be extremely susceptible to bullying, to being bullied. And it's unfortunate that we kind of have these variabilities in ways of being within children that can lead to this. But that's part of the reality. Now, there's a lot more brain structure that we can go into in this class, but it is something that is uh, part of uh, childhood experience. There's also family transitions. Um, as you can, children can relocate. That can be a lot of stress. They have to move. They have to um, find, figure out new ways of being. They have to find new friends. There can be changes in family dynamics. Parents can get sick. Parents can get divorced. There can be adjustments and difficulties and emotional stress. All of that can be a difficult part of this. And another thing that can oftentimes come up is children not knowing where they fit in, um, not knowing what they're good at. And when they don't know what they're good at, then it starts to question their value, their interest. And that can lead to a lot of uncertainty within their lives, particularly if there is peer rejection or social exclusion as part of this. That can be especially detrimental to a child that can carry through into their adult quite easily, adulthood quite easily. Um, rejected children may struggle from that point on to form positive peer connections and may experience loneliness and isolation for decades afterwards. And so it's important to help them to find a way to find social inclusion. And also there's the emotional regulation. And this is about developing effective emotional regulation skills. And this is a gradual process of, that happens during middle and late childhood. And so it's important for parents to talk with their children about, okay, how are you going to emotionally react to this? Why did you react the way you did? Think things through. Stop, slow down, and don't be controlled by your anger or your frustration. Um, and again, this is about learning to use your frontal lobe. This is the time when this is starting to develop, so it's important to help the child to figure that out. Now, uh, just a few key terms to kind of highlight at the end of this. First key term that I want to highlight is concrete operational stage. What does that mean? That is Piaget's stage of cognitive development during this middle childhood. And it's characterized by the ability to think logically about concrete events and understand things like conservation and classification and seriation. Then there's moral development. What is that? Well, that is the process of acquiring values and beliefs and principles about right and wrong, 
uh, behavior, and typically that's influenced by cognitive factors, by social factors and cultural factors. And just to kind of keep in mind that according to Kohlberg's theory, uh, children in late childhood are beginning to transition from what he called the pre-conventional phase to the conventional phase. So they're moving away from fear of punishment and moving towards more what does society say is right and that is helpful for people. Then there's the key term of, of gender identity. What is that? Well, that's when an individual's internal sense of being male or female or non-binary um, and how that may or may not align with the sex assigned at, the, at birth and how they feel that they kind of fit in. Then there's peer pressure. What is peer pressure? Well, that is the social influence that's exerted upon a person by their peers encouraging individuals to adopt a certain attitude or a certain value or a behavior to conform to group norms. And if we are to kind of look at this question, which developmental stage is characterized by the ability to think logically about concrete events and understand conservation and classification? Well, we already answered that one. That is the concrete operational stage. And just as some final thoughts, you know, we've looked at middle and late childhood, and I think that you can agree that it's evident that this developmental period is, is marked by some significant growth, uh, but there still are some challenges, and the opportunities that are there are just immense for children. Um, there's advancements in cognitive abilities, there's formation of social relationships and the apprehending of moral principles. And so that journey through middle and late childhood is something that's complex, but it's also dynamic. And it's something that we as parents and as caregivers need to be mindful of about all the complexities that are there. So. Whether you end up being a future educator or a psychologist or a parent or a caregiver, it's really crucial to recognize the unique needs and experiences of children during this stage of development. You know, we need to be mindful of the physical, but also the cognitive, the socio-emotional development. And we can better support a ch child's holistic growth and well-being through this process. Uh, moreover, it's really essential to approach childhood development with some sensitivity to diverse experiences and backgrounds and identities and always engage the child in the process. Having an open conversation with the child um, where we aren't simply telling them things but we're listening to them as well is extremely important and you can really begin to discover just how deep and how fascinating people are when you listen to children talk and talk about why they think what they think and so as we explore lifespan development i want us to kind of just remain committed to promoting an environment that fosters the resilience and the curiosity and compassion of children. And hopefully we will set up the next generation to be healthy and confident and empathetic individuals that do much better than we have done. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I will see you on our next, next lecture. You take care. Goodbye.